evening's panel discussion on the future of education. I'm sure a few more people will come in and they can just take their seats as they do. Um, my name is Miriam Borthwick and I am delighted to be the facilitator for this evening's discussion. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the land of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. This evening's discussion I expect will run for about 50 minutes and then we will open to questions from the floor. We want this to be a conversation, we would love you to be involved, uh, so save your questions and there will be a couple of roving microphones and we'll do it that way. Uh, on quick housekeeping matters, mobile phones on silent please, toilets are just out there to the left uh, in the un unexpected, unforeseen circumstance that something happens, I'm sure we just gather out in front right. of the building. In, I'm sure that would be logical. So let me start by introducing who we have on the panel this evening. My notes are not in the order of people who have sat, so in the middle we have Peter Hutton, that's where I'm starting. Um, Peter is a, a director of the Future Schools Alliance. He was a former principal of a Victorian school called Temple Stowe College. You might have looked it up. It's really quite an interesting case study, if that's the right word, where he significantly improved the numbers, which were very, very flagging, and improved the quality of the education at this school. Um, and he brought in a student-directed program of learning, and we'll hear about it this evening. It's quite an interesting study. Um, Peter believes that in Australia we have reached the point where education in schools is no longer fit for purpose. Um, and at the centre of the change that he has delivered is the philosophy that stopping doing education to students, instead putting them in charge of their own education. Uh, he did a Bachelor of Commerce at uh, Economics at Monash University, worked in business for a while, went back, did a deep ed at Monash, and is one of the few people in Australia who's been a principal of both a private and um, state education school. Michelle Radley, I'm glad we've got name tags. Michelle is in the red jacket. Michelle has a Bachelor of De a Business degree majoring in accountant, which launched her into a successful degree in accounting until she radically changed tack in 2008 and is now a business partner with Rio Tinto where she's held a number of management roles, all of which required significant <coughs> influencing skills to deliver results uh, without having direct control always over the leadership of the, of, and over the resources or the team. So quite interesting to hear what she has been achieving at Rio. Um, she's also successfully moved between corporate and operational focused roles, and her latest role is driving automation and digital optimization helping to shape the iron ore and information services and technology businesses of the future at Rio. So fascinating role. She's also a, a mum here at Santa Maria. Uh, Jennifer Ocean, you all know, of course, as our principal, a long-standing educator, leader in Perth schools, uh, has lectured in pre-service teachers at Notre Dame universities, held the role of science consultant with the Catholic education in Western Australia, and has a particular passion for curriculum with a focus on STEM education. She's led a development of a number of innovative programs for students in the areas of science and education, particularly for the gifted and talented. So thank you for having us all here this evening, Jennifer. Wonderful to have everybody here. <laughs> um, we have another Jennifer, so I'm going to delineate the two by calling the other Jennifer, Professor Howell. Jennifer Howell is Professor uh, as the Acting Executive Dean Learning and Teaching at Curtin University. And this role is focused on leading the central Curtin Learning and Teaching team, which is a really diverse portfolio. It includes enabling alternative pathways to tertiary education, which I'm glad we're going to be hearing about tonight, <coughs> outreach programs in schools, professional development for all Curtin staff across the five locations, uh, learning innovations, online learning, um, at the heart of this portfolio is a focus on learning innovation and teaching excellence, so very relevant for tonight's topic. Uh, and before undertaking a PhD, she had a career as a secondary teacher, so very knowledgeable as well. And finally, we have Georgia at the end. Georgia, hey, you feel like you're a long way away. <laughs> um, Georgia is a PhD candidate in organisational behaviour at UWA, but she also is at Curtin University in their Future of Work Institute. So already uh, canvassing diverse areas. She has a background in psychology, currently conducting research 
on the effect of decision-making bias and culture on organisational redesign and restructuring, which I'm really glad you're going to describe what that is, but my, <laughs> my simple sense of it is, is that the research that you do uh, is useful for both individuals and workplaces, but uh, you can describe it better than me. Um, so that's really the, what I think I just described is a bit of what the Future of Work Institute at Curtin University does. It seeks to better understand and equip individuals and organisations to deal with the evolving challenges related to the future of work, which is really what makes your role particularly interesting for tonight. Um, also, uh, Georgia does... Um, some, has been a community manager of Bloom. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Bloom. I've actually done a course at Bloom at UWA. It's a social enterprise that seeks to empower young people, I was not one of them, uh, with the mindset and skills needed to start their own business venture. It's a fantastic student-driven, student isn't it, organisation. So let's start with our lofty topic of the future of education. And I would like to start with Professor Howe because Many of the students from a school like Santa Maria uh, are going to go to tertiary education. And of course, tertiary education has changed a great deal from the time when many of us were there. So I'd love it if you could give us a quick outline of what has changed at university from when we were there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and how do we, what are the skills and capacity that students need to thrive at university today? Sure. Um, I think if I go back to when I was at university, we would expect with a single unit, perhaps eight to 10 hours of contact per week per unit. Um, I think the largest change you'll see is it's, it's roughly around three to four hours per unit um, per semester. So what has effectively happened is lectures are no longer large scale, 500 students in a room with a lecturer at the front. And they've been replaced with short videos, made by the academic staff member um, or digitally curated videos of content. And there's an undertaking now that students do a bit of prep before they come. Beyond their <coughs> readings, they watch the lecture video, um, they might do some online discussions and then they arrive for the three to four hours of more meaningful contact. They're smaller groups, they're 20 to 30 students, they're doing things that are trying to translate that theoretical knowledge into real life learning. So that sort of flipped it on the head a little bit. Now this is also very discipline specific. Some of the hard sciences might still have traditional labs, they might have um, different ways of presenting information, but we're moving away from that transmission model. We're moving away from exam based assessment. So it's more authentic, it's real, it's plugging in the professions that we're heading into. Um, we might have industry come in and we might pitch a design brief or they might be marking the assignment. So we're trying to make that connection between what happens in universities and the professions and the wider world more explicit, more felt. Um, so that's really changed the type of skills we're really emphasising and favouring at universities now. Resilience, it's a real key requirement, not only to be successful at university, but out there in the real world. And we're finding this is something we need to scaffold and help students with. They're not turning up to university independent and resilient. Um, so that's your generational <coughs> shift. Something's happened there. Um, we favour a lot of teamwork and, and that sort of results in a bit of groaning from students because we've all been in teams that don't work well, um, but we also work in teams that don't work well in our, in our professional world. So we do a lot of teamwork, we do a little team-based assessment. Um, we also favour a bit of independence and critical thinking. We're finding these are skills we're having to teach in the first year of universities. Um, so the first year of uni is, is tending to try to upskill students with some of these skills. They're also the skills we're hearing from employers and industry that we would like graduates who are really effective team players, really resilient and able when they hit a hurdle, they don't collapse in a heap, they're able to problem solve their way out of that situation. And um, we spend a lot of time thinking about our assessment and learning to try to develop that across the, uh, the years of study. 
and um, even the way we present our materials, we're sort of constantly thinking what type of activity will that result in, what type of skill, what type of learning. That's really, so they're, they're the, they're yeah, the that's really useful, I think. thank mm. you. And so Jennifer, if we're talking about how a school like Santa Maria prepares students for that environment that was just described, um, what do you do and how much has education changed and changing to meet those expectations? Mm. Look, I think it's really interesting because there's lots of comments out there in the media that education hasn't changed. I actually think education at Santa Maria has changed. Um, so that's something that I think is really important. Um, I think in terms of some of the key changes for us, it's things around technology. So that certainly made a big difference. So we have students who are, um, this week in fact, we had here five students who were making podcasts for book reviews. Um, in our day, I don't think we knew what a podcast was. Um, so that's a great example. Um, girls have had opportunities in our brain STEM courses where they've been going off to um, Murdoch University working alongside scientists. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the connection with life um, is certainly improving in terms of what we're offering and what we're doing. So I think it's not only through the courses, but it's also through the uh, co-curricular program that we offer because I think there's some great areas that we offer there. Um, I think something that Santa Maria does particularly well is our values. And those values are really important, um, not just at school, but when they go beyond school to university, but out into life. And it's about using those values to help them with making decisions around, for example, technology. So we will be making decisions in the future about um, what we're going to be using technology for, because that's within our control. So how do we as a school then prepare the girls to be able to take those values and use those for great decision making um, in their lives, but also in their work? Mm, thank you. And Peter, you brought about significant change in a particular school. Can you, first of all, just briefly outline, if it's possible to use the word brief and outline in what you achieved, um, what, what you did? So uh, our school was quite a, a different context, uh, certainly to Santa Maria. Uh, it was a government school in a fairly well-off area in southeastern Melbourne. Uh, it had declined from 1,000 students down to 286 students and just 23 year sevens. So that wasn't a nice inheritance when I, when I got that job. They weren't doing anything wrong, they just weren't doing anything particularly right either. And uh, we, we were given 12 months to turn the school around, otherwise it would be closed. And so we looked around, there was already a lot of uh, schools, what, you know, really well functioning schools in the area doing traditional education well. But what we realised is that the current model of education wasn't suiting uh, a significant proportion of students and I would put it at at least a third. And so we decided that we were going to move from a model of do to you education to a model of take control. So where the students were actually given the ability to take control of their own learning, supported by their parents and, and by the, the school staff. So in the course of eight years, we went from uh, that number of 286 to 1200. Some of the innovations were to drop year levels. So there were no year levels in the school. Uh, why would it be that every young person needs to go to secondary school for six years? Some of them you know, are smart enough to do it in four and others might need seven, you know, that might set them up. So we did away with that. We did away with all compulsory subjects. So each young person, generally selected six subjects that they could study from more than 160 electives. Uh, other innovations, there were about 80 businesses operating everywhere from sort of, you know, staffing their businesses. And I'm not talking <coughs> you sort of $20 boss, I'm, we had ten two and a half thousand dollars business startup grants for the students to, uh, to undertake. And we also employed 10% of our own students to help run the school. It's radical. <laughs> <laughs> It, it worked, that's, that's the reality. Yeah, and that's what I was curious about. Um, when we've already just heard about the requirements, resilience, being able to work in teams, be flexible, when you've got student-led um, learning, if that's the right term, um, why don't students just gravitate to the type of learning that suits them? Do they get pushed to learn in ways that might not suit them but could extend them? I, I guess that comes back to one of those fundamental questions. So everything that Jennifer outlined, and you know, I spent a brief amount of time, so I don't know Santa Maria, so I'm not going to speak about that as a context. But it's a, you know, it's clearly a very well-functioning school. The staff are amazing in their level of, I didn't observe any teaching, but um, just because of the time that I was here, but their level of care is, is um, you know, palpable, you can, you can feel it. So I 
you know, I, I, I give my comments uh, separate from this as a school. But the culture of education, even though we now have technology, much of that is doing um, what was done on pen and paper. It's just now done far more efficiently. You know, we're, we're now, you know, we used to have pen friends. Now we can, you know, email and those sorts of things. The, the, the points that I would uh, look at is the, that schools have a culture of isolation. You know, they, they, you come to school, the majority of what you do is at school. What I believe the future is calling for is far more permeable membranes so that school and, and, uh, and the community and work and professionals, you know, move in and out freely. We need our staff not to be uh, isolated in schools, you know, like, you know, a staff member that, that hasn't been out, you know, in their profession and yet is teaching it, you know, I, I bless them, they do their best to keep up to date. But they need to be able to move fluidly in and out, you know, and, and, and then they don't get jaded as well. And, and the biggest point that I would make is that the current model, even though it's certainly improving, and I agree with you, Jen, it's not that it hasn't changed, but it's, it's still a model of teacher, small group of people, do to you education. Whereas we don't trust that young people can make, when they're well supported, can make good decisions in their own best interests. Mm. Michelle, in the workplace, from what you've just heard described, from the resilience, the teamwork that, that Professor Howell talks about, the self-driven learning, <coughs> but, but self-styled, what works in the workplace? Um, all of that. So, so I think um, you know, in the workplace a lot more now where we're, we're going towards what we call a networked organisation. So, so, you know, um, we have sort of subject matter experts per se um, that work in their areas and then everyone's got to work together to solve a problem and deliver that into the, you know, deliver an outcome. So, so you do have to work via influence, uh, as we've talked about, but um, you do have to be able to pull teams together to collaborate, to, to be curious, um, to be resilient, because things don't always work and they're never gonna always work. So how do you, how do you bounce back from that? Um, so, so yeah, all of those things, it's, it's great to hear, because that is what we're looking for when we, you know, when we look at graduates and things, we absolutely, marks are, marks are great, but we're looking for what else they can do, how they can display that they can do other things um, juggle priorities, um, look out into the community and, and you know, give give things back. And, and so we want really well-rounded individuals. So whenever I'm looking for a graduate, I actually don't want the top couple of percent. I want the, the next level that have had to work really hard and, and can show that they've, they've learned stuff on the way. Mm. So so absolutely, the, the collaboration piece and how you, how you pull things <coughs> together and, and problem solve is, is really critical. Can you just tell us a bit about what you do? Um, so, so in my current role, um, it, it is focused on, um, so I've got sort of two parts of the role. One is a traditional infrastructure sort of project delivery piece um, that delivers uh, comms infrastructure into our minds. Um, the second side of it is how we drive that digital optimisation and, and digitalise the, the mining processes. So we all live our lives on our mobile phones. We don't have connectivity in the mine sites. We don't have digital. We have you know, print out paper work orders and things like this. This pile is high every week and hand them out to people and they write notes on it and then they give it to someone else and they still type it into the system. And so all of that sort of stuff is what we're, we're trying to drive. Um, getting the data into the systems and then, um, then starting to use machine learning and AI and, and be really smart about getting the right information to people who make so as an accountant, what sort of leap of faith did you have in changing <laughs> tech so radically? I mean, that must have put you well out of your comfort zone. We're yeah. talking about resilience. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a number of different roles across the career path, um, and then an opportunity came to to go out to our operations centre at the out at the airport. Um, and I had a leader who was was just confident in my ability and said, "No, you can do this. You can you can go around. I don't know anything about mining. I don't know anything about technology. I haven't led a team that size. So I had a team of 380 at the time, um, <coughs> blue collar workers. I'm a professional. I'd always worked with white collar workers. So yeah, it was really daunting. But I had a leader that went, "You can do this. It's just you know, just draw on draw on what you know and." Um, trust the people around you to, to help you. So I think my learning there is you do have to trust, you have to be curious and seek to understand, and you don't have to know all the answers. Mm. 
Um, so, and I think that's what you know you guys are talking about, trying to teach the kids that in this context, so that then it's not quite so daunting um, when you go out there and have to do it. It's also a really good illustration of some, how some of these really big organisations, just if they see a young grad with good values, hard work, you know, flexibility of mind, they invest in them, and the professional development that these places offer is fantastic, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Georgia, when you study organisations as a psych, um, what what are you noticing? from your research and then what you take out to organisations that, that they are needing? Mm, um, definitely very similar to what's already been discussed um, around teamwork and problem solving and creativity and, and of course technology. Um, specifically some of my research focuses a lot on healthcare um, and I find it so interesting to go into that context where um, it's very you know, rapid changes in technology. Um, for example, um, we do a project um, in uh, the operating theatre department of a, a public hospital um, and the technological changes are massive and rapid, but what they're um, struggling with or what, where the real kind of complexities or problems lie is in the teamwork. Um, often operating theatre teams, I don't know if you know, people come in in the morning and they often have never worked together before. Um, sometimes they don't even know each other, they don't know their name, let alone what their role is. Are you the surgeon? Are you the nurse? Um, and so in these environments, one of the specific projects that we've been involved in is doing something simple as having a, a team briefing or kind of like a team huddle at the start, um, literally to introduce each other and then of course discuss um, the patients and the list for today. Um, and what that is really about is about that communication, that collaboration um, alongside the technology, but it's those sorts of things that when um, uh, research shows that when things go wrong, it's typically a communication failure and it's often very preventable. Um, and so through some of the, these sorts of case studies like this, we really see that absolutely technology is important, um, but even in these very technology intensive environments, it's the ability to communicate, particularly also with people who have different backgrounds to you. Um, I know that example is seen in medicine, but I'm sure if you have someone who works in healthcare or you work in healthcare yourself, you know that there's still quite a strong sort of hierarchy, particularly in the operating theatre. Um, so it's about breaking down those barriers and communicating and being flexible and creative and working together that in a lot of the research that we do we still see is kind of really important. Keep doing it, sounds essential to me. <laughs> um, we talked, uh, I'm going to go to both Jennifer's, listening to Michelle talk about being out of your comfort zone and the jumps that you did were definitely that. Um, Professor Howell, you alluded to some of the things that Curtin University is doing to assist students to be prepared for that. How do you help students, particularly those who are really into the, in, in getting good marks in the theoretical learning, mm. uh, to shift to what's required in a workplace, <coughs> which is, can be so different? And then Jennifer, I was going to ask you how you prepare teenage students for being out of their comfort zone. So Professor Hart, it, It's interesting. <coughs> I, I always am fascinated by the students who have got the top ATARs and how much they struggle when they leave the school context and come into higher ed. And I have a 19-year-old who did exactly that as well. And, and um, you know, she was a brilliant straight-A student. And then when Caitlin hit university, it was really different. It, it, was, it was a different way of learning and it was, it was really difficult for her. And, and um, she's at University of Melbourne, wanted the interstate experience, which broke my heart, but um, she's over there having a great time. But it was a really hard process. So what we try to do is try to embed as much work integrated learning. We call it will, um, but it, it's not about placements and, and, and doing practicums in work sites. It's about trying to bring the work into the university context. And we try to mimic an awful lot of what happens there. And we find by introducing this in a very slow and steady drip through the first year and really ramping it up in second year, they've learned to fail. Um, they've learned it's not the end of the world and can pick themselves up. We create very low stakes assessment items where they might have to possibly pitch to um, their peers or they might have to present a particular project management plan, they might have to do something that's very real and authentic and where we hope they'll get to by the end of their degree. But we break it down into little doable chunks and then when the failure hits or when the difficulties um, arise, 
the stakes are not so high and we slowly ramp it up and, and we just sort of try to normalise failure and learn from it. Um, we do a lot of dreaded reflections, you know, and when we say we're going to do a reflection, <laughs> the moans are, are really quite loud, but it is that way that you make sense of the fact that, oh, it didn't work, this is what I would do differently. Reflect on what you did, critically evaluate what you did. So they're the skills that are inherent to being a resilient individual, and it's not just in your learning and in life. It's in every aspect. So I think that parents, you know, yeah. my age and a bit younger, think and worry about hearing so much about the online learning and the not attending right. lectures and where, you know, do you have enough contact right. hours and points right. and people yep. for these young students? How do you know if they're coping with not succeeding? Look, it's quite hard to get students to turn up to class. They hit 18, they've got their driver's licence, <coughs> they're not turning up to class having attendance, um, take it every single day. They go a bit crazy in the first year, that's fine. They rein themselves back in when they get their first <coughs> marks, have that horrible conversation with mum and dad that first semester, they, they get themselves sorted. <laughs> but we're also really realistic that they don't want to come five days a week. They would like to work. Often they're trying to work in, an, in a profession or a job that's allied to where they'll eventually end up. So they're wanting um, the income, the experience of being an adult, to earn some money. They also want to study full time. So universities underwent quite a number of changes over a long period of time. We were really slow to get this message. We would turn up, we would be there. For the first week, we would have 100 students. By week three, there'd be 30 of the students and the lecturer. And uh, we realised we needed to change how we were delivering things because students just didn't want the eight to 10 hours of contact. Um, and, and that was a really hard learning lesson for us. We support by blended learning. So you've got online materials, you've still got three to four hours of contact. What we've found is that they turn up for those three to four hours now because it is a doable chunk of time. We timetable it so it's generally crammed into three days. So they'll get two days that they'll be able to work. So we're not being pulled um, by the urge to earn money. So we've sort of changed how we package and deliver the learning. Okay. The quality hasn't changed though. All right. So Jennifer, yes. having yes. heard all of that, yes. how do you feel that we're preparing our teenagers for that environment? Well, I think at the moment we're doing a great job starting in year five with our Fearless Five program, where one of the key things that they do in that unit is famous fails and they have conversations about people out there in the world and the fails that they've had before they then reach the success. So I think we're starting to certainly have those conversations. Um, also too, we've had a big move away from content knowledge to really application of knowledge. And it's been a really interesting journey for lots of our girls, but also for parents, because it's always interesting when girls have real challenges, that sometimes it comes back, is the teaching effective? So is it a challenge in the learning or is it about the way that it's being taught? So we also have to be very careful that we enable success to some degree, um, but also making sure that the girls are challenged um, with their learning. So I believe that we are starting certainly to have these conversations throughout the year groups. I um, mean, in fact, last year with our focus on grit, um, many of the girls really understood um, what that was about. There were lots of conversations around that as a focus across the whole college. Um, to the degree that even when on the last day when the year 12s left, um, that there were some tags around the school with the word grit. So um, I think they certainly graduated knowing and understanding <coughs> what that word was about and that there will be ups and downs as they go through life. Um, I think we also give the girls lots of opportunities for success. So I think certainly through our programs such as drama, public speaking, um, some of those sorts of areas where the girls have to really be brave um, and to step forward and have a go. Um, they're given lots of opportunities for those sorts of things to represent their house, um, to try a new sport and something that we really encourage in uh, particularly year seven when girls come in, try different co-curriculars. It's not always about trying the things that you're comfortable with because you might find a new interest or a new passion from having a go. That's so right, I mean, we can't underestimate the, the value of all of those extracurricular experiences and, and that you can't always be a perfectionist if you're no good at sport or drama, but you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Peter, is what you've described, and we'd love to hear more about what you um, believe in what you've delivered, would you call that the future of education? 
um, what was just described then? Well, well, no, more of the experience that you've had at Temple Stowe, the, the taking away the year levels, the student-directed learning, the broader yeah. opportunities of choice that they might have had. I'm curious as to whether kids still would choose to do STEM and, and hard subjects if they're given choice. There are a number of students that do subjects in terms of they are occupying a seat, but they are not doing the subject. So, you know, we, we ran this thing, we used to get a, uh, of the students would get a washi, which was some feedback from the staff each three weeks on their work and study habits. You know, were they, were they coming prepared? Were they making good progress relative to their own ability, etc. And they, they were an aspirational score. Out of, out of four and you know we, we would look through them and sometimes a student might have you know a 3.8 and a 3.2 and a you know 3.1 and then a 0. 0.4 because uh, they were aspirational and uh, and then you know a 2.7 and you go what, what's happening with this you know 0. 0.8 and oh, it's maths you know I don't get it or I, you know it always seems to be maths I teach maths so <laughs> stick me up for it I love it but you know they don't always but, um, you know, and, and I've gone, well, why are you doing it? Like, you know, I've looked through, as a maths teacher, I've looked through the maths curriculum and basically beyond year eight, there's nothing that I've ever used in anger other than a little bit of statistics. I've taught it to year 12, but like there's a little bit of stats in the, in the year nine Australian curriculum um, that, that is useful. In fact, I think it's really good, but you don't basically need anything beyond your eight. And I'm, I'm calling it. Happy to. <laughs> 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 that's, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, you show me where you've used it, okay? You know, we all do calculus. Who does calculus? Who's ever used calculus in anger? <laughs> yes. And, but, but we all did it. Right, and there's, and there's two people that have, that have done it, and you still you don't use it now. The, the the point is, we we are exposed to a lot of things. And I said to this young person, you're not actually doing maths; you're just there. All right, there will come a time where you might need maths, and and then you will find your passion to to do it. But we force kids into positions, and then they have a bad experience, and then they're turned off that subject for good. And I, I really believe that what the future is calling for is more of a just-in-time learning. If our students leave knowing when they want to learn something, they've got a whole array of learning skills that they can attack that problem in this way, that way, that way, you know, bring in other people. One of the problems that, I, that you were um, <coughs> suggesting then, uh, uh, Michelle, yeah, is that, that you don't get to be a solo operator in a, in a work setting anymore. And yet school is based on individual assessment. Like we, we do group work, don't get me wrong, we, we do lots of it, but really the, the, the transaction is, is individual and you know, collaboration is called cheating. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, need to, we need to move to more complex ways of working and understanding that like even, even if they were exposed to everything in the Australian curriculum, it's still that much and it hasn't actually changed, the content hasn't actually changed that much from the spectrum of, of, it, of in all information which is this wide and getting wider and yet we still teach this uh, for a range of reasons. And I think that's one of our biggest challenges is moving from such a content driven mm. curriculum that we have um, and unfortunately a lot of that is legislated by government Correct. so um, I think we've got to work very closely both um, the, uh, the government bodies, uh, the universities, the schools because it's also the universities that are driving a lot of the ATAR directions mm. that we have mm. uh, and I think for some of our students it's very much about um, if we look at our access students and the programs that they do and the opportunities they get in the workforce to develop those skills, you know, is the access pathway, is that the pathways of the future um, if, if ATAR you know, is causing so many issues for students when access or VET can provide so many great opportunities. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes in the future. Yes, I, can, I, I was only talking to a dad last week who does uh, uh, he's in a company that does underground mining and he's devising AI and technology that can analyse uh, under the surface so to yeah, accurately know where to drill, I assume is where he's heading. Uh, when his son came home and talked about a particular equation that was really hard and, and said, oh, God, I'll never do that sum again, what was the point of it? 
And I said to the dad before he replied, and I'm sure you replied, it's about exercising your mind, it's about broadening your opportunity to sort of uh, strain around something difficult, it's not about that equation. And the dad said, no, I just said, no, that's exactly the equation you need to know. I'm not interested in graduates who are, in who are good at communication. They get enough of that in, in drama and public speaking. <laughs> I need them to do the hard sums. So there is the whole variety. Um, <coughs> as a psych, I'm assuming statistics is big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, my like personally from my um, university experience, yeah, a lot of statistics, <coughs> um, but still a lot of like very much my experience is that of rote learning, and yeah. I swear I've forgotten a lot of what uh, I learned in my undergraduate degree. Um, but I was fortunate enough that the nature of the psychology degree is very research oriented, <coughs> so implicitly I was kind of learning how to think critically and how to evaluate evidence and based on an understanding of the statistics behind the evidence. Um, but also I think I had a great set of experiences, not outside, I wouldn't say outside, but extracurricular things that I did <coughs> um, during my degree that were voluntary, that took me from um, sort of emergency services, volunteering to, to somewhere like Bloom, um, which I think importantly was completely unintentional. Um, and was kind of, I can reflect on it in hindsight and go into job interviews and kind of craft a perfect story of how I did this and that, and that leads me to where I am today. <laughs> Um, but it was very much, I think I was just lucky um, and supported in an environment where I could explore different things that interested me, um, that I enjoyed, um, followed people that I enjoyed working with. Um, and really, I think it was that that paired alongside um, the sort of classroom learning that yeah, has led me to a point where I'm very, very happy with kind of where my career is headed and the experience that I've had and, and what I've learned about myself along the way. It's interesting talking about all of those things that can sustain you through because of course life, life is not always easy and, uh, and, it's, and there are challenges we have to overcome. What do we all think that the nation needs in the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> Australia is the richest country in the world. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but on media, on a med that's the only time I've ever used median in anger, by the way. <laughs> but uh, according to the median wealth, we are the wealthiest nation on earth, and yet in the OECD, we are the uh, 36th worst in the, in of all OECD nations. And we, we like, I think we've got to remember that we're all, and I'm putting myself in this group, we're probably not from the lowest socioeconomic group if, you, if you're in this room, okay? But as a nation, we've only got 24 million people or thereabouts. We need every one of our young people to be a success. For every student that drops out, right, and doesn't make it through to, you know, um, to some form of, of further study, it costs, the, we've looked at this stat just um, recently, so it's in my mind, $411,000. $411,000 over, the, over their working life, costs to the health system, costs to the legal system, uh, um, tax foregone. That is a huge cost. And, and we cannot afford any young person to be in a system that, it, it's not like, will they fail? It's statistically, it, it's, been, it's been happening for the last 20 years. To do the same thing and expect a different outcome is insane. You know, we need, I'm not saying change it for everyone. For those young people for whom it's working, bless them, let them continue. But we cannot have significant amounts. 20% of, of young people in Australia don't complete year 12. You know, if they're disengaged by the time they're 24, they're, there's almost zero likelihood of them re-engaging. Mm. You know, we need to offer other more flexible pathways. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, I think on the seats is the um, theoretical knowledge, sorry, the uh, Schools Connecting Learning to Life document, which Santa Maria recently released, am I correct? Yeah. So hearing what Peter's has talked about and what we've talked about so far about this future, which has different requirements from the current or past, tell us a little bit about what you're wanting to achieve with this document. Sure. I think now with Google, the knowledge is available, so we don't have to teach the knowledge. You can search anything and you can watch a video and you can be an expert on it in no time at all. Um, whether it be something mechanical, something IT, um, whatever it might be. So the knowledge is there. So 
I think going forward in the future that schools are going to be focusing on developing um, what we've called attributes, and you can see those on that green um, page. Um, we did break it down in the, to the particular areas that you can see there because we really felt that there were particular personal um, attributes that we wanted our students to have which are really important and particularly with our Mercy background and our Mercy heritage but the importance of those values in the decision makers of the future because I think there's going to be lots of decisions around the use of AI, um, around environmental issues how we're going to be dealing with those and I think ethics is a big part of everything that we do so I think that's really important. Um, in terms of some of the personal attributes um, there's a range there um, certainly um, um, in terms of some of the key ones that I think there um, <coughs> adaptability I think has got to be a real key one given the number of jobs that students are going to have in the future um, they're going to learn the skills um, on the job um, but they've got to have that confidence to be able to change uh, pathways both within the organisation but also to other organisations <coughs> as well so I think that's important there. Curiosity is one that um, Michelle and I have had many conversations around um, but again that willingness to learn because um, I think we're all going to be learning throughout our lives we can't just finish school and we're in a job and that's it that every job will be evolving and changing so that our girls need to be willing to be adaptable and to be to brave to take on new challenges. Um, and interestingly, the financial literacy is one I'll just touch on that when I spoke to students about connecting learning to life and asked them, and I asked various groups, which of these do we do really well and which do we not do so well, and financial literacy was the one that they didn't rate very highly. So um, even that in itself is a great um, piece of information for us to be going forward with. So um, I believe that if our students can and parents could go through and look at this document and then by the end of year 12 tick off and say that my daughter's had opportunities <coughs> in these areas, then that's a far better, greater benefit to them going out into the workforce than to be able to know what the formula for carbon dioxide is or to know calculus or to um, be able to you know, name the mountains in America or whatever it might be that I actually think it's these attributes that are going to make them really well prepared for the workforce. Mm. I was actually talking to the former chief scientist um, Lynn Beasley recently and she very strongly <coughs> said that all women need to have financial literacy. She's actually launched a, a program and I can't quite remember what it's called but obviously it's financial literacy for women and her, her main line is a man is not a plan. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is very true. Um, Michelle, the young grads that you're seeing coming in uh, and what Jennifer's just been talking about, do they have enough of this now? Do they need more? What are you seeing coming into your workplace? Uh, so I've seen the trend that there are more that are well-rounded, but um, not enough. Absolutely not. So... Um, what are they missing? Uh, a lot of them are very, very technical. So they get the technical understanding, they've learned it all, they don't understand how to apply it, they don't understand business context, um, they can't translate. So, so whilst your, um, your guy that is, is um, doing his research for underground mining says he wants to know that equation, actually it's the translation piece, the being able to be creative. So you know there has been that adding the A in, in STEM and making it STEAM because it is, it is absolutely, there are the technical components and, and all of that, but we do still need that creativity, that bigger picture thinking um, and being able to tie all of that in together. And, and as um, you know, AI and computers and all of that sort of stuff comes in, we still need the humans to do the thinking. Um, and that's, that's the bit that we need to, to help um, empower our kids to do that and to be able to to be able to pull a piece of information from here and go actually that's that's related here and this is how it works together um, and that's that's not always what we see. Mm. Both Jennifer's the teaching of STEM and particularly for girls as as um, as we are at Santa Maria. Um, you have a strong belief and emphasis on it. Do you see that STEM needs to be changed in the way it is? Taught, delivered the application of it more emphasis on that mm. it's really interesting with the whole stem debate because we are promoting it but to get girls interested in it is really challenging and I think we're really fortunate we've got some fantastic facilities we've got um, fantastic electives that the girls um, start off in um, and certainly if they're human based or uh, linked to life then they're much more likely to take on those courses so brain stem um, is a course that is really popular with our girls at the moment and going forward and knowing that 
the health industry is one of the fastest growing um, areas in the workforce, you know, is that such a bad thing if those health areas are what the girls are so passionate about? Um, to be going into those sorts of fields. But I guess it's those areas of technology and making it relevant for girls so that they do develop that passion from early on because um, in terms of choosing those subjects, certainly in year seven and eight now, they're having to choose those subjects. But again, that's not through choice. It's because they're required to because <coughs> of curriculum requirements um, of the authority. But at least it's giving them that exposure and opportunity which they may not have chosen if they had free choice about not doing it. Mm. And Jennifer, and the other mm. Jennifer, um, mm. uh, how do you shift or create that balance of the need for good theoretical knowledge mm. and the capacity to apply it? Mm. We've been um, trying to spend an awful lot of time changing both inside courses, um, and I absolutely agree with Jennifer about the. Uh, required subjects in the ATAR uh, pathway into universities is quite difficult um, and perhaps not the best um, pathway with subject choices and prereqs and all of these things students get sort of channeled into at school. Totally agree <coughs> but as a sector we're, we're quite nervous to be um, innovative in that space and you would require all of us to jump at the same time but we're not brave enough to say I'm going to turn on physics as a requirement for that course. Um, because we're all desperate to make sure that we fill our classes. So there's a whole other piece going on there at the moment. But um, we've just started looking at how to embrace co-curricular um, and, and tether it to courses um, and apply some sort of credit into courses for those sorts of activities. <coughs> and we've got this thing called Curtain Extras. So we have a list of different things and it could be volunteering in the community, it could be undertaking particular units where you might go off to Mongolia and you stay in a yurt and you build a school in, in that area. We've just had 60 students come back from there. Or it might be something here in, in Perth. So, and, and using that as that whole person development. So that they're out there experiencing life, growing up a bit, problem solving, seeing the connection to the real world and what they're learning at uni and, and coming back and, and becoming a, a better developed person. and. Our subjects within the courses were sort of releasing the control and the prescriptive nature of university degrees and were adding in things called specialisations which are much more multidisciplinary and they're not limited to traditional major and minor. So you might have done history with a minor in French. Um, very traditional, it's the type of thing that I did when I went to university. Now I might do um, political science with a, a specialisation in design thinking. Sounds pretty cool. And it's really, really relevant to the real world because design thinking is essentially an action research cross with problem solving. So you hit a particular issue, you design a solution, you trial it, you then evaluate, did it work? What modifications would you make? Sounds pretty real world to me. Mm. So we, we're trying to modify the content but also encourage the co-curricular into the courses. And Georgia, that's in a way what Bloom does, isn't mm -hmm. it? That entrepreneur, exactly. and is that, did Bloom come about because students recognised there was a need for more of the application of the learning into the real world? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it came about a, a small group of students kind of wanted to start their own business and realised that there wasn't a lot of support around, not just kind of as a sort of technical or support around how do I set up an ABM, um, but also community support of people who are doing it themselves and going through the same thing and you can kind of talk to about it and bounce off ideas and then meet other people who are then sort of joining your You business. might need to tell us a bit more about what Bloom offers or does. Sure, so Bloom, um, yeah, supports the young people um, who are interested in starting a business, whether it's um, sort of more social enterprise or, or the other end of the spectrum. Um, there's a co-working space, um, support programs, um, and also actually um, about a couple of years ago, a little while when I was into Bloom, um, set up a partnership with similar stories to UW with UWA where um, students could participate in what was called the, the Bloom Launchpad unit where they could get credit for, um, for starting a business and they come into Bloom for a semester and they, um, they have an idea or maybe they have just a broad sort of interest. Um, and they go through a series of workshops, they get mentorship, but again, also chatting to each other about what they're doing. Um, and and it's, it's exactly that piece around 
I'm doing this degree or I know some stuff, but now I have to apply it and now I have to navigate a situation where there's not a right answer or a multi-choice option sort of situation um, and where I need to know what to do when I do things wrong. Um, and I need to know how to create a situation where I can do things wrong safely. Um, and so I think that's, yeah, that's really been what Bloom has been about is giving young people the opportunity irrespective of whether it becomes a multi-billion dollar business or something that kind of trickles off or something they even keep going on the side throughout the university um, education, giving people the opportunity to experience, and I think business and enterprise is a really great um, situation in which to exercise those skills. Um, but again, also to understand what it is that interests them, what they're passionate about and what they enjoy and what they don't enjoy. Um, yeah, that's, that's very much um, been what Bloom has been about and it's been really great for me to kind of be in that environment and then take away those, those learnings myself. Mm. And Peter, at, at Templestowe, kids did get very much involved in it was business enterprise work. What, what was it that they were doing there? So I guess we'd call it entrepreneurship. Um, so we, one of, one of the things that concerns me is we, we come up with programs for kids to do. You know, we're now all going to do $20 boss. Uh, you know, which is which is a program that you know that is out there. Everyone gets twenty dollars, and you know the slogan is, "What would you do if you had twenty dollars?" Well, most of my kids would say, "I'd take a friend to Macca's," you know, because you know what, it, it's a great concept, you know, encouraging all young people to to start a business. But if you give a kid twenty dollars and they've got to pay it back, like, goal, you know, it's the best advertising NAB have had, you know, putting putting their money behind that one, but. You know, to tell a kid that they've got $20 and they can start a business is basically saying, you can't start a real business, so play with 20 bucks, okay? I've seen, you know, 13-year-olds run catering functions and turn out, you know, 200 meals at half the cost of a commercial, you know, operation. Um, you know, young, young people can, can do these businesses and they can, you know, like all, the, all, all of the skills that, you know, Michelle uh, and, and Jen are talking about, are skills of one-off. They're one-off. They're not, you know, you know, with, with respect, they're not going to Mongolia and living in a yurt and, and building that. No, no. Like no, no it's a, it's not, I would no. do it it's too. An experience. Man, I would have gone to Mongolia. It, it's a broadening experience. But, absolutely. But, but it's a program, right? Like, I want the kid that says, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to Fiji and I'm going to, you know, teach English or what, whatever the case is. It's the, it's the spark. It's the get up and go. Like, you know, I'm an employer in, in the FSA and the people, like, I, I need people that can generate their own business. And if, you know, if the people in the audience are in your own business, the people you want to hire, hire hard, manage light, yeah? You hire them, you do, you do all your reference checking, but once you've got them, they can go out there and they can generate their own work, they can solve their own problems. The, the last two years, of secondary school is the most conformist year. We were talking about that today, Jen. Great stuff happening in the lower year levels. Come year 11 and 12, your risk averseness has to be, you know, like, you know, you need to dial your risk averseness right down, follow the rule, churn the material, throw it out, not the time for showing you big creativity, unless you're at 90, you know, 95 plus where that's called for. You know, just, just get the stuff out as you've been told. Regurgitate what the teachers have said. And, and then we launch them out into life and, and then go, why can't these kids think for themselves? Well, why do you think? You know, we've, we've rewarded compliance. We've re rewarded conformity. You know, the best time for these young people to make mistakes is when they're in an environment like this where there's caring adults monitoring them and can pick them up and get them on their way. I am, I do, final comment, I do believe that there is core learning, okay, I do believe that there are some core things that young people should be, should be taught, but as Professor Yong Zhao, who's a good, good uh, friend, a friend of the FSA and he's a well-known academic, the core has become the whole apple, okay, it is so jam-packed full, we, we don't trust the kids, we don't want them to lift their, their heads and look around, and so everything is in the core and there's no meat on the apple and that's why it's unpalatable. Excuse me, what's the FSA? Uh, Future Schools Alliance. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we definitely have gone over time, which is great. Uh, we've got a couple of microphones and uh, at either end here. And yes, we've already got a hand up, which I love. Um, and can we just 
my years of experience of doing this say, ask a question as opposed to a statement. Okay. I frame my question as an engineer who now does some occasional teaching in one of the tertiary institutions, and so my comment question may not apply to all <laughs> subjects. It's going to be a but question, I can tell. <laughs> given education, tertiary education is now the second or third biggest export for Australia, the University of Engineering particularly is full of overseas students mm. and Australian students leaving schools <coughs> don't seem to have the wherewithal to cope with mixed cultures, religions, mm. approaches to doing work. How do you set that up in an Australian school so our kids can still work with the people they have to do group assignments with mm. when they get to university? Mm. Good question. I think it's both Jennifer's. Well, I, I mean, uh, yes. Look, it, it, it is. It's it's tricky because um, international students will stay with international students in the class. Um, so, and every time we try to mix groups up, and and um, you get resistance, and you get hysteria, and you get resentment, and all of these sorts of things, and it, it's really challenging. We can um, add units into university degrees requiring you to learn these skills. Um, it would be really nice if we weren't starting from zero, but sometimes it feels like that. Some of our courses attract more international students than others. The hard sciences really do pull a lot from China and India and, and um, some of our nations in Northern Africa, and, and that's really very challenging for us. We had to rigorously pursue these students because of the higher education funding model, and it changed, and, and we really needed to to pursue international students to, to keep um, financial, yet we have this downside where our local students are really quite perplexed how to deal with um, very diverse student cohorts. And sometimes some of our staff, to be perfectly honest. So um, we, we hope that the schools um, are able to meet us halfway in this, in this, in this space, but um, schools are not as diverse as universities. That, that, that's really an issue. Workplaces are perhaps not as diverse as universities because we also find that many students don't find jobs at uh, the international cohorts and, and come back to us for post-grad trying to find jobs. So there is a bit of a, a strange mix going on. Do I have a magic solution? Not really. I'd like more of an aptitude and an attitude in our student cohorts to be slightly different. Mm, possibly in our society as well. Mm. I think the whole group work is a really interesting issue because when we put students into groups um, and we give them assessments to do, there's real challenges because obviously you've got a couple who do all the work and some that don't do any of the work and then everyone gets the same mark. Um, girls are not happy, parents are not happy. Um, so we've really gone down that pathway of um, we do group activities, we don't do group assessments or we do less group assessments where you're actually given a mark. So you can still have that group experience of working together, researching together, um, but there's no mark attached to it. So if you take the marks away from it, group work is fantastic. When there's marks attached to it and reports, that's when we get those issues. So I think that's a real dilemma for schools in um, you know, developing those group work skills. But I also think there's some other ways we can develop group work skills outside of the curriculum. So through our co-curricular <coughs> programs, our Vinnie's groups and the work they do in the community, uh, through our choir groups and the leadership and the opportunities they have to work there as groups and ensembles. So I think it's not just within the curriculum where the girls will develop those skills. Um, they also, within those co-curricular groups, work with a wide range of year groups. So they're working with younger students and older students. So not just different cultures, but different ages. Um, and I guess it's just something that we need to continually be aware of um, going forward in how we develop those skills and how we work with younger students to actually give them roles and to try and structure some of the group work so that as they move through to year 11 and 12, they're really quite independent in the way they work together in their role in a group and to understand that responsibility that each person in a group has. Um, but it's a real challenge. Mm. Interesting <coughs> though, and are there any other questions while I blab on? Good. Um, I'll wait till the microphone gets to you. But it is interesting, isn't it? All of those other things that you listed where the students are together, which they might not even see as group work, but all of them have their benefits. Yes. 
Um, um, sorry. Um, I just want to say first, congratulations. It's been an awesome session and it's one of those things where I think everyone's involved in agreement. It's just trying to work out how to make the change. And what you're doing with the girls on, on the attributes is to me exactly what needs to happen. My concern is that the system is what is holding us back. Everyone's trying to do what they can within the rules. But you know, in America, they're doing great things in terms of that infusing the workforce in, allowing kids in their higher years to actually work and then get credit towards uni as part of the work as well as doing school. And in the UK and, and Europe, they're actually, you know, the consulting firms are not asking for degrees anymore. They're saying, come straight out of school, we'll do a skills assessment, we'll take you in. So my, I suppose I'm looking for a ray of hope that you know, what is the path forward in terms of influencing the change? And particularly from an industry point of view, what's industry's role to actually push the system and say this is not working? Because my concern as a parent, you know, we've only got a handful of years left and then it's too late for our kids. What can we all be doing to help fix the problem? Look, from an industry perspective, um, we are absolutely trying to do that. We're going out there trying to influence universities um, and schools in terms of the skills we need and, and what we see as the future of work. Um, we've just done, Rio Tinto have just um, done a whole pile of work on, on developing um, automation qualifications um, and going in. So, so um, we've done a, a certificate too that can be delivered in an event in schools and starting to try and drive that and understand the skills that are required there. Um, some some micro-credentials and then a Cert four as well. So, and then we spend a lot of time, um, we've got a team dedicated to, to university engagement and, and understanding sort of how we can shape those skills, um, but we do also need to think differently about how we bring our graduates into the organisations for sure. And Peter, you talked right at the beginning of that involvement with parents, and of course parents can guide students into whether it's helping tutoring a younger student, whether it's being involved in the surf lifesaving, whether it's involved in volunteering, whether it's involved in music and clubs and, and activities outside and inside of school, all of that broadens a child's capacity and a student's capacity to interact, engage, be social, be flexible. How else did you bring parents in? Um, to be honest, I didn't, we, we didn't really need parents to be, uh, to be involved. Like if you actually look at the, at the research around the impact of parents, I hate to say it parents, but post post primary it goes down to sort of five to ten percent. Like that's that's the reality. The biggest the biggest single impact is peers and that's that's effectively why, you know, independent schools are, are, are really successful because you're buying a peer group, like you know, and a solid one. However, in interesting because I feel that in what we've done in terms of sharing these sorts of documents with our parents, that you're really important in this partnership with us on the journey with our girls. So for you to understand the skills that we're teaching um, and embedding all the attributes that we're hoping to develop, hopefully you'll be having similar conversations at home um, about that. But one of the ways that we're, because you could say, well, you've got this great document, how are you actually going to do it? This is the easy bit. It's the how you actually do that is the important part. And so what we've been doing is that heads of learning, in particular, um, in all their subjects, are looking at how we actually embed these attributes within their uh, learning areas, so within their subjects. So we still have to teach the content, but how can we embed the problem solving, the critical thinking, the adaptability, how can we embed those in the courses that we currently offer? So um, that's the stage that we're at at the moment where we're really looking at um, not just having it on a, um, a document, but really embedding it in all that we do. Um, not only um, within the curriculum, within the co-curricula, uh, within our enhanced learning programs, so programs such as Explorate, which are the particular focuses um, of the attributes are we focusing on through those programs. So that's what we're aiming to do, step by step. So a little bit by little bit, we're not going to change it radically at this stage, but I think we can still start making a difference by um, really embedding it much more closely. I think I can offer a few rays of hope. It's not as bad as me. Um, I think if we separate professional qualifications, so nursing, teaching, medicine, accounting, things that have got a registering body controlling the content, push that to one side. I think um, universities are micro-credentialising. So the viewing universities as a three or four year degree for your, for, your, for your children is perhaps misguided now. Perhaps we should be thinking more about little small bite-sized chunks that are timely, that will take me to the next step and then I'll come back to uni and I might get another bite of information. 
maybe at some point I'll cash all these little pieces in for a degree later on. And, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're unbundling everything. Um, we're also offering up more flexibility within the courses. So if you do want to come along for a three-year experience, we're not going to tell you what the content is anymore. Go and shop around and put together photography <coughs> with microbiology and sports science because we can't predict what your interests are, but also what the future of work is going to look like. We, we keep hearing that these, um, the current generation will have seven to eight different occupations. Now, if I think about all of the jobs I've had, I've always stayed within education. So my undergraduate degree was great, set me up for success. I had my Bachelor of Arts and my Bachelor of Education. But we have no idea where these students are going to go. And I, I tend to think we need to be everything for everybody. So we need the degrees, we need the research degrees, we need the professional, but we also need the other. You know, and we've got MOOCs and we've got unbundled pieces of information. Um, we've got so many different pathways in that ATAR is not the be all and end all. And I think that message hasn't gotten out very well. And students despair and they put themselves through the pressure. So there's lots of hope out there. Yeah, maintain hope. And, and I think that's the key word, is that that's what I believe the role of parents is, yep. is to give our girls hope yep. that there are jobs, that they are going to have a job, they are going to have yep. a career. It's going to be a bit different in format to what we've had, mm. but they will have jobs and they will have futures and they'll be just different. Mm. Um, so I think that they need to yeah. really understand that and for mm. us to keep sharing that message, not making them worry that... There's, there's, they're not going to be jobs and mm. um, and that IT and AI is going to take over everything that we do. Because in reality, we control, as a human race, what AI is going to do. Yes, that's exactly what Michelle was saying, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think the other thing, as speaking as a parent now, that, that we all need to do is actually shift our thinking um, and, and just think differently, listen to everything everyone said here as well, and it's, it's just not the pressure mm. that ATAR has to be the pathway. Mm. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a, tw a 19 year old who now looks at me and goes, why did I do ATAR? I shouldn't have done that. And I'm going, I told you that, why didn't you listen to me? Um, <laughs> but there is lots, lots of us who put that pressure on our kids because that's what we think they still need to do, mm. and it's not. Yes, and, right. and I also have had a lot of involvement with a young Indigenous student who did not do ATAR, then finished school and said, actually, I'd like to go to uni, did bridging course, alternative pathway, has just graduated from Melbourne yep. Uni. So the options are there, which is exactly yep. what we would want. We are very much going over time. Is there another burning question? Yes. Could we just wait for the mic because it does oh. make it easier? Oh, sorry. No, you... Sorry, would you like to jump in because you've got the mic? Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I'd, I'd like to congratulate the panel as well, and I'm coming from a perspective I know it's a futures evening here. I come from an early childhood perspective. So um, the content, the how, the what, the when, the where, it's all happening. But then my question is, in the light of our human interaction and our understanding about identity, particularly in a world that becomes supposed to be rapidly complex that way, should we be focusing, as Peter has talked about, deconstructing the curriculum, about why, and enabling children to sit down in a panel like this and go, why am I learning this, and is it purposeful for me? Pretty powerful. <laughs> I, I would love students to keep constantly questioning. That would be great. Um, there's a, there's a lack of bravery and a lack of um, wanting to question and I think it's the product of year 11 and 12 and our, our schooling sometimes because they've, they've come out and they're weary and, and um, the dreaded gap here used to terrify me and now I almost think it should be compulsory. Yeah. Go and shake off year 11 and 12 and I think you come back um, to uni. It, it's a risk because I've got that going on right now and I'm thinking, make sure you get that four minute enroll because I don't want to be gapping for too long. But um, they, they've, they've blossomed and they're, they're, they're questioning. That's lovely, you know, and, and I wish we had a bit more of that. But um, I think our year 11 and 12 doesn't encourage that. I think general studies does, but I can't convince people to sort of bravely go down that pathway. But Let's have our final question. Mm. The final question really is based, um, sorry, Jen, from what you were saying. So I'm a student coach, um, and I coach students from all different backgrounds and different schools, from Perth Modern to private to public mm. schools. I'm hugely concerned about the mental health of our kids. Mm. I'm seeing it every day, and I'm telling you it's getting 
to a point of crisis. Yes. It's actually a crisis. Um, mm. The youth suicide. Um, it's it, it's such a crisis point, and um, I suppose my question is because it's very real. The mental health of these students through year eleven and twelve, whether they are high achieving ATAR students, are coming to me broken with the pressure that they're under to perform. I'm seeing kids from Access General, or whatever that other expression is, who feel completely disengaged. Now, I'm not saying all students, but I'm seeing a large proportion of them. And I suppose my question is, for schools, is, it is a crisis, what are we doing about it? If, if, okay. In my mind, the thing that we need to do, it, like I, I, in, the, in my dealing with unis, they're actually on on board for the for the change. Mm -hmm. It's not them. It's actually and and most educators, you know, would echo your thoughts. It is. It, we are at crisis point. It's it's actually um, the authority, frankly. It's Nessa in New South Wales. It's V uh, it's VCAA in Victoria. It's it's a number of frankly bureaucratic people who who are dictating mm -hmm. without a mandate. I might add. They have no mandate for this, but they're dictating this, you know, this content-heavy final two years, which is then trickling down all the way through to primary school. And and we as voters need to start, you know, lobbying with our local members, saying this is not good enough. And can I play devil's advocate and say, for decades, if not centuries, we've had A levels, O levels. ATARs, TEs, ATAR, you know, mm. leaving certificates, whatever, we've always had those sort of standards. So I'm just going to finish by saying let's also broaden out our thinking. It's not just education that has changed in our society. And I think that, can I just add one final comment that I do think is families have changed, expectations of commitments outside of school have changed. Um, so there's many, many factors. Um, as you say, um, when we were at school, we did. Um, I remember doing six ATAR subjects, and it was two years um, that we had to study the courses for. So the demands on us were, I think, were even greater. But there's many other factors now that are part of that. Um, so we are, as a school, looking at what we can do um, with our mental health strategy. And I think the most interesting part of us in developing that strategy strategy is hearing from the students about the causes, mm. but also what they see to be the solutions. Because it's no point us as adults determining what those solutions are. We need to have that input from the students. I would like to wrap up by saying what an amazing uh, discussion we've had this evening, having canvassed so many different topics from so many different experts. And I would like to say that there's not just despair, <coughs> that there's not just ATAR factories, that we've heard that there are some fantastic opportunities happening for students, that Santa Maria is clearly embracing uh, a whole variety of perspectives on how to bring up these young women well. And I wish you all the best as parents. It's a bit of a rocky old road. And, uh, and, and luck comes in part of it as well as genes. Um, but if I could ask you all to thank uh, panellists, I'm sure there's time for a cup of tea and to, to have a final one-on-one -on -one chat. But let's thank you. <laughs>